Thank you for watching this virtual lecture event hosted by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, a new doctoral program. We also offer the opportunity to take a single course without having to pay an entire semester's worth of tuition costs. One could also audit such a course at a much less cost. If you are interested in learning more about us, please visit iwp.edu. This lecture will cover themes from Dr. Bakshuri's IWP course on energy security and the new geopolitics of energy. This course focuses on the transformation of energy use over the past century and on expanding our understanding of today's concepts of energy and how they fit within the rubric of national security. This evening, we will be hearing from Mr. C. Derek Campbell and Dr. Sarah Bakshuri. C. Derek Campbell is the Chief Executive Officer of Energy and Natural Resource Security Incorporated, an international security company providing best-in-class physical and cyber risk mitigation solutions for critical energy infrastructure and natural resource assets. In this role, he leads the strategic engagements of the company and directs the development of all market entry strategies. Dr. Sarah Bakshuri is founder and president of SVB Energy International, a strategic energy consulting firm with offices in Washington, D.C. and Dubai. Dr. Bakshuri has about two decades of experience working in the energy industry with extensive experience in global energy market studies, energy strategy, energy security, and geopolitical risk. She has consulted numerous government, private, and public entities, and international organizations like the IMF and the World Bank. She is also a member of the Energy Task Force of the Cyprus Climate Initiative, which was launched and initiated by the President of the Republic of Cyprus. She is also a Professor of Energy Security at the Institute of World Politics. Well, thank you so much to both of you for joining us today. Back in April, Dr. Bakshuri, you joined the IWP podcast to discuss the impact of the coronavirus outbreak on the energy market. For those of you who missed this, you can find it on our, our SoundCloud at soundcloud.com forward slash the IWP. In this podcast, we discuss energy supply and demand, the Russia-Saudi oil war, U.S. shale production, and what the future would look like regarding market stabilization. Now, almost two months later, how have things in the energy market changed? Thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure today uh, to open up uh, the doors of our classes, uh, to, to class to uh, the audience and to our uh, guest speaker, which uh, myself and students are excited to um, ask lots of questions about uh, his experience uh, with regard to uh, energy security. So it's, uh, as you said, uh, Lindsay has been almost two months past since last we had a discussion uh, on uh, together about the impact of the uh, COVID-19 on the energy market and how things changed. And as we discussed, the major changes was the shock on the demand, that how the demand suddenly shrinks up significantly. And at that time, we had the, pro uh, the price and market share competition between Saudi Arabia and Russia. And as we discussed it, I said that I don't believe there is a war going on, but the necessity of uh, the decision at that time. After that, we had the OPEC uh, historical uh, OPEC plus meeting and decision uh, that the OPEC uh, plus cut back significant uh, amount of uh, production, uh, which has been extended again uh, for another month. And now the market is we are facing a gradual um, uh, recovery of demand uh, from the the from April, which was hit the highest. Uh, there are uh, estimates that the demand was uh, hit about uh, somewhere between 25 to 30 million barrels per day. In May, uh, this shortfall was lower, closer to 20 to 25, and in June is expected to be way lower. Uh, so the market is expecting to demand to recover gradually. Uh, obviously, this is not going to be uh, um, the demand recovery on a macro level. Obviously, we see a, a U-shaped recovery, but when we go uh, break it down by different uh, types of products like gasoline, diesel, and um, uh, um, uh, jet fuel, the recovery has a different uh, path uh, in our class, our students are uh, studying in details. Uh, they're very well uh, aware of refinery processing and 
how uh, uh, each of these um, uh, products have been hit. For instance, we don't see still they're flying uh, recover back uh, to pre-COVID. So we are expecting that the jet fuel is not going to recover as fast as gasoline. On the other side, people are taking their cars more than public transportations or are going to travel with their cars. So we're expecting a faster gasoline uh, production. Then looking into gas market, there is a different story. We are having huge uh, uh, volumes of natural gas liquids, NGLs, that have been cut back from the market due to lower oil production. And these could all impact on the uh, gas, uh, natural gas market. But what is very uh, important for us uh, today uh, to look into is to uh, how the security of critical energy infrastructure uh, is going to change uh, with regard to all these black swans that we were facing this year and uh, with particular regional look because uh, this session and uh, in the past two sessions with, uh, with, just, with our students, we were discussing the geopolitics uh, of energy and how the uh, energy security in terms of geopolitics has evolved and changed. Uh, so I would like to um, uh, give more time to our guest speaker today, um, uh, Mr. Campbell, and ask him uh, to tell us more about the threats against the uh, critical energy infrastructure uh, before COVID and if he sees any new sets of threats uh, posing this infrastructure currently uh, at this moment. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. As you know, it's always good to talk to you and work with you. Uh, and you're right, right? It's a great opportunity and a good timing to talk about the other pillar of energy security, right? Which is the one side is geopolitics, the other side is critical energy infrastructure asset protection. And as if you and as you and I have talked before, some of the indications and warnings that we see in that, you know, anti-threat risk mitigation world have really been driven up by what, what we see with COVID and depressed oil prices, right? You've got situations now where you've seen an increase in the types of physical attacks that happen against oil and gas and power utility assets. And you also see some increases in the types of cyber threats that happen uh, to those assets, particularly uh, vectored at the what they call the ITOT environments, the, 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 the information tech and the operational tech where those meet. Uh, you know, with attacks on industrial control systems, with attacks on SCADA data. And one of the things that we're finding now, you, you know, you've seen a trend over time, but this year you're starting to see some real action take place, particularly in the Middle East, particularly in Africa, where uh, now you don't have uh, nation state against nation state as the only, um, uh, I'll say, participants in this kind of vectored attack against critical energy infrastructure. It can be an individual, it can be a rogue nation, a rogue state, a terrorist outfit, a criminal or van, you know, a criminal outfit or some type of vandalism that can really impact a nation's capability to mon optimize and monetize its natural resource assets. And so uh, if you look globally, um, unfortunately, particularly in the emerging and frontier markets, right, what, what we have happen is there is a big, um, almost kind of uh, passe, uh, kind of general passe uh, attitude toward security of critical energy infrastructure. It's normally looked at as if it's a cost. People don't understand that that's really truly an investment for them because it impacts ultimately their ability to, to do what, maintain continuity of operations and ultimately achieve resiliency. And so as we saw pre-COVID and now post and now during COVID, and now post COVID, there are really two areas where from an indication and warning perspective, where we've seen threats uh, kind of increase, uh, I'd say one toward power utility assets and then two toward oil and gas assets and particularly oil and gas assets that are either near shore or offshore, right? So on the power utility side of the house of things, we've seen a lot of what cyber attacks and those things are impacting uh, also oil and gas assets. What you've seen uh, in the oil and gas market in particular is a spike in piracy, both offshore West Africa, now in the Gulf of Mexico, as reported last week, uh, and it's impacting uh, folks' ability, whether it's an independent operator, right? Um, some some 
a sub IOC company like a Marathon or a Noble of, of that that type of operational capability, or a Peristatal themselves, like NNPC, right? In terms of what it produces, what kind of output it produces for for global offtake. And so, unfortunately, particularly as you look at non OECD countries, and you look in the Middle East, and you look in Africa, and parts of parts of Europe, even the smaller producers, they're so focused on producing their oil, right? Uh, that all their money goes into that. And if they've got a, a fence and a couple of guys at, at the gate, then they think that that asset is protected. That cannot be further further from the truth. And as time continues to progress, what you'll start to find, whether again, it's nation state on nation state or down to an individual who got pissed off at something that happened at his job, right? You're gonna see the attack of critical energy, the, t- the attacks on critical energy infrastructure start to go through the roof because you can get a country's attention, you can get a company's attention when you impact their ability to optimize and monetize their energy operations. Does that make sense what I'm saying to you? Yeah, of course. So what is your what is your suggestions then to investors, especially at the time that now, well, you know, most of the companies because of the oil price fluctuations and significant yep. hits on the oil prices have significantly reduced their capex and opex their expenditures uh and mm-hmm. they are trying to be more careful on where they're going to spend their money sure. so what what sure. do you what do you uh, suggest because some of these low cost resources are in areas that obviously the risks and threats are high against the energy infrastructure so what is your uh yeah. suggestion? So, so, so the ultimate su- suggestion is to stay vigilant and that 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 message is to the owners and operators, but also to the investors and insurers. And so we'll talk about this from a couple of ways. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you about four or five recommendations that I normally give from a stay vigilant perspective about mm-hmm. how to handle these issues. But I do want to talk about another thing, and this is really focused at the investors and insurers, right? Yeah. It is when they go into particularly an emerging frontier market and they look at hey, how do I uh, mitigate the risk toward my capital investment, right? They usually take a financial risk perspective and they say, hey, you know what? We're going to go ahead uh, and invest in this project, whether it's Greenfield or a current operation, and we're going to squeeze the project so we get our money out in three years instead of maybe letting that uh, opportunity or that rather that operation mature over like a 10-year time, time horizon which you would see like in an, in an asset you invest in, in the OECD, OECD type of country, they'll squeeze that asset. And then all of a sudden that owner operator is trying to pay off that debt for the investment. The investor gets his money back and all the other issues, whether they be some type of physical or cyber threat, they just kind of, you know, hope and pray that that doesn't happen in the three year time horizon They get their money out and then they're on to the next project. But what happens? That asset doesn't get a chance to mature and that owner operator doesn't get an opportunity to monetize that asset. And so, again, this is why those owner operators view, hey, security is a cost. I have to look at maximizing my, my operation in other ways. So I say, hey, investors, insurers, change your look, change your focus on that and almost mandate that the owners operators have a good security posture in place through through a good assessment. So they understand where they where you know, how that operation is impacted by the environment that it's in. Mm-hmm. And, and, and what you do is you mandate that they have some good security posture so that ultimately, you know, that that operation will will have what's called continuity of operations so that it can be optimized and monetized over time. And so I would say to those owners, operators, um, I give about four bullets. I'll read some of them to you that, that I give often. One is assess and review, right? Assess and review uh, using good um I'd say protocols like NIST uh, 800-171, ISO 27001, the, the Critical Infrastructure Structure Protection Cybersecurity Framework. Make sure that you're, you're implementing and uh, those frameworks and using them as review tools about where you currently stand or where you need to stand if you're starting an operation. The other is monitor your employees, right? A lot of times when you have problems, security problems at your asset, uh, at your operational asset, it may be something as silly from a cyber perspective in particular, an employee sticking in the wrong thumb drive into a network and all of a sudden your network's got ransomware, malware, things like that. 
for instance, you saw what happened. I don't know if this was an employee initiated issue, but uh, it's, it's really about the cyber piece and how it can impact an operation. Uh, last year, uh, th there was a major oil and gas conference in Angola. It was their first time doing it. They were showcasing the nation and its oil and gas assets. They were talking about doing some um, what, what they call uh, 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 operational uh, or, or the opening of fields for, for operators to come in and buy those fields, those marginal fields. And during that week, when they were having all this pomp and circumstance about their assets and, and the new uh, legal regimes that were supposed to be inviting for people to come and do business in Angola, they had a ransomware attack at Senegal at their headquarters and shut down all of their computers during that time, right? So those are the types of things that people need to be aware of. Um, spot check your existing physical um, and technical security measures, right? Even if you have something in place, you got to know what that something is. And then you have to ask yourself from an evaluation perspective, is that really enough to put me in a posture to make me attractive for, for foreign direct investment and also help me stay within this paradigm of being able to not only mitigate the risk, but also maintain continuity of operations so we can achieve resiliency. So it's a concept of uh, assessing uh, your environment, assessing you know where you're operating and understanding also the human terrain of where that operation is taking place. And, and finally, I'd say again, do, do some uh, reflection on how you view security, whether you're an owner, an operator, investor, or insurer, right? How you view security, is it a cost or is it an investment? That's right. It's very important. It's like yeah, if you have an insurance for the investment. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would like to ask the participants if anyone has questions, they can, I think, type their questions uh, in the Q&A uh, box and Lindsay would um, collect the questions both uh, from those that are participating on the Zoom and uh, those that are sending on their, uh, their questions from uh, Facebook. So just, um, I think this was a housekeeping uh, thing to uh, remind everybody that uh, they're most welcome to ask their questions. So I'd like to, Derek, sh shift to cybersecurity in particular. You, you already mentioned about this, but um, something that like we had a lot of these discussions with the students uh, that there are some of these critical infrastructure, let's say like energy grid mm -hmm. and uh, the electricity grids or um, uh, water desalination mm -hmm. uh, systems. Mm -hmm. the, it's very critical. Not only some of the cybersecurity attacks would uh, paralyze the function of a system, but some of them could have physical consequences. Absolutely. Uh, um, I don't know, like create explosions, uh, uh, absolutely. massive uh, explosions. Absolutely. And if it happens, uh, we were like uh, studying the possibility of uh, cyber attacks on, let's say, a whole uh, power uh, generation system and a grid, uh, some of these transformers and some of these. Uh, 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 parts of these infrastructures are very hard to be replaced. It's not a matter of a day or two. So if there is any explosion happening, it's not just a computer system that could be solved. Maybe in a day or two, it takes uh, time to be ordered, to be built, rebuilt. And, uh, it's not like a small uh, infrastructure that we would have them like stored somewhere in a back store. Right. So it's very critical. And there are some countries, especially that they have more vulnerability due to their temperature. Yeah. Uh, if there is no electricity for a few hours, then the food would perish. And uh, there is a food security. And their drinking water and generally uh, water desalination, they're all connected uh, to that grid. So if there is any threat against, let's say, grid, uh, especially, there's going to uh, have disastrous uh, result. What What do you What would you tell us about that? I tell them everything you just said. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, that was very good. So, so the, the point, the, the real salient point is, and and I don't want to just focus on cyber. We can we can add physical to that, but we can also add technical, like we saw what happened in Saudi Arabia with the drone strike last year, right? When when you impact a piece of critical energy infrastructure, mm -hmm. there are always there are always secondary, tertiary, coordinary effects, right? That that are just like the ones you named, where if you you take out even let's say a diesel storage facility, right? And that diesel storage facility was feeding a power grid, then that power grid shuts down. 
then once the power grid shuts down, you impact daily in, uh, daily interactions of the community that that power grid was servicing. So there's secondary tertiary effects, all okay. because somebody didn't take the time to do an assessment to say, hey, is this particular diesel asset that feeds all of this activity, is it protected against a physical cyber or technical attack? And you've seen that particularly in the Middle East and in Africa, and I'd say you know, parts of Asia where there is no concern given to that, and then bingo, you have these, these issues. And these attacks can get quite sophisticated, and I don't, don't let me paint the picture that OECD countries are immune to any of this, because uh, I'm gonna do a share screen very quickly. Is that, is that doable, guys? Yes. Okay, so for instance, um, Can you guys see that? Yes. Okay, so this again, all pre pre COVID, several years ago, there was a there was a power station that had an attack, right? And it was there was a sniper attack against the power station, right? Mm -hmm. Look at the kind of damage that was caused there. If you take a look at my screen, you can see that, right? Yeah. Well, what? No one in their right mind would have thought that someone would take a rifle and shoot out a power grid. But it happened, right? 17 transformers were seriously damaged, $15 million worth of damage, and there was a blackout um, for, for, for quite an extensive area, right? So, again, secondary tertiary effects. You yeah. saw what happened at the gas facility attack in Algeria. When you look at the hundreds of millions of dollars lost, the number of people that got killed, how the community was impacted, and how that really impacted the overall. Um, I'd say national output for Algeria and how it impacted from an energy security geopolitical perspective, people who were off taking gas from that facility, right? Yes. Then you, you look at the constant threat that you have here, right, in Nigeria, right? So you consistently have these kind of um, serious attacks in the Niger Delta that, and every year you can go to OPEC, they talk about it, how the vandal criminal terrorist threat against Nigerian oil and gas operations impact the country's ability to meet its quotas, right, exactly. every year. And so then there's a, the secondary tertiary effect on jobs, on, you know, uh, internal use of that, of, of that crude product inside the country of Nigeria. It just goes on and on. And then again, I'll bring up the ransomware attack. You saw that ransomware attack that we talked about in Angola. Angola was showcasing, um, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's oil and gas market and how safe it would be to invest there um, and all types of opportunities that would exist in that market. And bingo, they get us, they suffer a massive ransomware attack that impacts their ability to even execute on, you know, um, the things that they talked about during the conference. And then we'll go ahead and talk about the technical attack. Again, this is something that I want to bring up. If you mind me kind of yeah. going a little deeper down the rabbit hole on this attack. Sure. Uh, to really talk about this kind of secondary tertiary effect piece. So you saw what happened in Saudi Arabia last year with the drone attack, whether it was Yemeni or not, nobody knows. But this particular attack only cost about two hundred fifty, maybe three hundred thousand dollars to launch. This attack caused almost a billion dollars in damage. And if you look at what happened to Saudi Arabia's output, how it had to then rebuild this facility how it had to then put uh, countermeasures in place uh, for potential future attacks that may or may not occur. You're talking several billion dollars in damage that have impacted what, I mean, in Saudi Arabia, somebody, everybody will say, oh, they got enough sovereign wealth to handle any, any issue. But yeah. to, to say that this was not an impactful event for them is it would be over, you know, a real understatement to really kind of how they were impacted by this. So imagine if this had been Nigeria, if this had been Sudan, if this had been Libya, it would have completely overturned the country's ability to generate income for itself. And so, again, you have to maintain vigilance, which is what I talk about often with um, uh, in, in this type of, of setting. Because if you don't do it, here's some of the things, again, I've talked about. Um, if you don't put take the time to do assessments, to put the right mechanisms in place in order to um, uh, avert these types of uh, 
these types of attacks, these types of uh, incursions into into what I would call a sovereign's capability or ability to to operate their assets, you, you're just asking for a problem. And what I would encourage folks, particularly globally, and particularly your students who may may you know learn from you and then go work globally in these markets, particularly in the emerging and frontier places. Mm-hmm. Talk about security and make sure it's something that happens in the C-suite, right? It is a C-suite issue. It needs to be talked about in the C-suite um, uh, in, in a manner that is, uh, uh, I'm trying to put, uh, get us back to a point where I don't share my screen. Um, it has to be talked uh, about in a manner that is um, a part of not only the security officers of uh, uh, roles and responsibilities. It's ultimately the role and responsibility of the CEO and the COO and the executive chairman and the board to be on top of this, just like they would the finances of the operation, right? If you don't have the right security posture in place and you don't assess that, then you really are impacting that asset's ability to be monetized and optimized. That's right. Thank you. Let me go to, we have some questions from the participants. Uh, one of them asks, what countries has the greatest risk of coming offline due uh, to a critical infrastructure attack? Uh, that depends, right? I would say to you, it's easy to say Nigeria. But one of the things that <clears throat> I guess we know in the market, uh, security professionals, is that it's a very weird dynamic here that, that goes on that not all attacks on critical energy infrastructure are reported, right? So that's the reason, yeah, they're not, right? They're not reported because they impact that company's insurance, Uh right? And so if they talk about, hey, you Mm -hmm. know, if there's some major event, some, you know, more than three or four people are kidnapped and they obviously have to go public about that, but they try, particularly like the mid-tier operators and below, uh, and particularly some peristatals who uh, are, are don't have a lot of world stage, but and they, they want to get there, but they don't want to show that there's a lot of risk in their market. They don't talk about these events, right? Because it impacts insurance, it impacts uh, their ability to be attractive for two, two and four foreign direct investment. And so, uh, if you're not in the industry, right, you don't really, you really don't hear about a lot of the things that go on. So, I would say direct answer to the question based on what you see in the media. Is Nigeria, but there are other countries who suffer from that, uh, particularly in the Gulf of Guinea, uh, particularly in the Indian Ocean, uh, and believe it or not, in the Gulf, right? There are all kinds of uh, things that happen in the Gulf that people don't talk about. So that that really depends. I, I would tell you that the reason Nigeria gets, you know, the exposure to what's happening there is talked about so much is that it, the, the attacks and the types of vandalism and the impact that this the attacks on their critical energy infrastructure have are just so enduring, right? It's just enduring there. And it's a problem set when you walk in and you do an operation there, you can almost bet your your dollar, your dollars that you're gonna get attacked. And that's the thing that's confusing to guys like me who are in the industry who protect these assets, is that people continually still try to go have these operations and they again look at security as a cost versus an investment. This is very interesting. Actually, as uh, so as part of our class um, uh, evaluation, we don't have an exam, but the students have to write a, a couple of essays, basically an energy security plan for a country that they would choose as their case study. So for they have they gradually during the semester they complete this and they will come up uh, with a final energy security plan for a country that they choose. And we have a student that is working on Nigeria. And okay, okay. Uh, we, uh, as we discussed before the, uh, before starting uh, the, uh, um, uh, the, the event together uh, about Nigeria, he is uh, specifically working on the threats uh, in the Niger Delta. But yeah. before I dive uh, specifically into that, we have another question from one of the participants from Australia. Uh, he's referring to the rooftop solar industry, which is well subsidized in his country. Mm-hmm. And he's asking your opinion on uh, the risks, benefits, costs, and costs of having rooftop solar electricity generation uh, and a distributed generation in general. Yes. So I would tell you that 
you know, I'm not a th an authority on that. In fact, I'm a guy who doesn't like renewables. But anyway, that's another story. The the, the thing I would tell you is uh, it, it is about it really doesn't matter what the power, the generation source is. You get my point. It still has some fundamental components to them. It's generation, distribution, you know, uh, transmission and distribution. And whether it's a solar asset, whether it's a wind farm, and it really doesn't matter where the um, assets are, whether they're in Australia, whether they're in Bangladesh, Nigeria, Argentina. The one thing I will say about this narrative I talk about with owners, operators, investors, insurers, is that the investors in particular are starting to get smarter, right? And they are starting to understand that, particularly in OECD countries like Australia, um, this issue about cyber vulnerability to things that are generating, transmitting, and distributing power, those cannot be understated or overlooked. In fact, in a lot of countries, particularly in the United States, doesn't matter what the power generation source is, if they don't have the right cyber protocols in place to protect the industrial control systems at that facility, they can get fined. Right. And so in Australia, what I would say to you, your, your student who who is looking at that market and, and or operating there that ask the question about, hey, what is the robot? How robust is the cybersecurity capability and to what standard is the cybersecurity um, kind of construct uh, of those assets that are operating? Right. Because it's not just the rooftop. That 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 sun sunlight's coming into that photovoltaic on that rooftop, and that power is going somewhere, right? And some of that is into an individual home, but some of that power is then being taken to some general, you know, transmission distribution setup, right? And there's exposure there, even at the individual home, right? In terms of the industrial control systems that have to be put in place to to operate that small that tight circle of of generation, transmission, distribution within the home. There's exposure there from a from a cyber perspective. Yeah. So I think um, one one aspect that we all agree that increases the resiliency and energy security is uh, diversified sources of supply. Right. So obviously, the more diversified uh, supply sources we have, the risks are the, the tolerance and resilience toward the risks are higher. And I think in this particular example, having those rooftop uh, solar panels would obviously increase the energy security and resiliency of uh, the final uh, users of uh, electricity in, th in this uh, case households because if there is any threats against the central uh, power generation uh, power uh, grid or generation system then this con these households could benefit from switching to their own rooftop uh, solar uh, panels and uh, generate the electricity required for their, let's say, daily uh, consumption, uh, considering if they might have a batteries to uh, save uh, electricity for night, because we were talking about, again, this is like a very, um, uh, very important, especially for hot households or industries that they are benefiting from their own energy uh, or electricity generation, power generation. But again, we should not... Um, uh, undermine uh, the threats against the central. Yeah, that's what. Uh, I, but no, I, I'd even say at the home, Sarah. I mm. mean, the, the still the way you even monitor that, right, in a home yeah. is through a network, right? right? And and an individual home can be attacked by an angry neighbor, right? <laughs> I mean, that that's what what can happen. And so when you've got a skated data that's freely flowing through networks, and you've got industrial control systems that have many attack vectors on those industrial control systems. Some of the networks that they run over are, are legacy based, right? You, you have exposure even at the home level, right? Yeah. Especially then as you start to grow out to the neighborhood level slash community level and then beyond, right? And so again, I think it's important um, to, to really, no kidding, make sure that you've got not just the cyber piece taken care of, but if you, particularly if you got a network of like homes who are put, putting in power into, um, you know, a community or a neighborhood, right, with these with these uh, photovoltaic cells on these roofs, roofs rather, um, it, it's 
it's the sensors, right? What cameras do you have? What CCTV network is there? How do you respond to something, some vandals? My, my biggest this? worry is that someone hack our cameras. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right, exactly. <laughs> Right, that that could happen as well. So, and, and you know, you you've experienced that before. So, so the issue is again for your your colleague in Australia, ask the question. And what what's what's unfortunate is that they may be unpleasantly surprised about how much exposure really exists, even at the home level, for the little micro energy operation that happens there. That's right. Um, so uh, we actually have uh, one of our doctoral students who is actually come up as a pilot. We discuss a lot of uh, this, how the cybersecurity even could impact the flight and aviation. Yep. But something that you mentioned is that most of the companies don't report their attacks on their uh, infrastructure because they're worried about insurance. Do you do you agree? What what we were discussing with the students is that often their countries also do not. Uh, mention if there is any cyber security attacks about their infrastructures. Or, I don't. What, what is the reason for that at the that, country level? Th some of it is sheer embarrassment. In the case of Angola, right? That that really didn't get reported by the government or the country. That got reported by folks who knew that it happened, and then it hit hit the press another way, right? And so they don't report that because it what it says to, in particular, foreign direct investment. Hey, there's a risk to my fund, my capital investment into this operation, into this country's operation, into their ability to give me a good return on my investment, and for them to ultimately even try and uh, not not only uh, monetize but optimize the operation so it can make money over time. Right? They don't want to be able. They don't want to talk about that. But it, you know, this is kind of an indictment for those who are in the public sector a little bit, right? So those who are this is just some things that we see internationally, right? That's you know right. me, we, you, you've seen me all over the, the world, you and I run to each other. Um, even in countries that you think would have this nut cracked, they don't, right? In terms, particularly on the cyber and the technical side, they will tell you things like, hey, don't worry about this asset that either we're gonna take your money, you're gonna help us, you know, you're gonna invest in this existing operation and we're gonna be able to expand it. Or, hey, you know, this is a new greenfield play and we're having a bidding round and we want you to come invest money. And, and some smart person will say, an insurer investor in particular will say, hey, well, how are you going to protect this asset? Because we get some indications and warnings. There's some real threats here uh, that, that uh, might impact the operation here. And they will tell you, governments will tell you, well, don't worry about that. Our military's got that covered, right? Well, guess what? You look at these countries and the state of their military, they don't understand the key performance indicators that drive the operation of an, ener of an energy asset. And they certainly don't have the capability to deal with any types of cyber threats that happen, um, particularly from like serious black hat nations or black hat teams that are very sophisticated uh, with how they install ransomware malware and then do what you said do cause some kind of industrial control system malfunction to cause a physical damage, right? They don't have any ability to, uh, to uh, avert that, let alone detect it before it happens. And so the issue is a lot of countries kind of almost turn a blind eye to it. That's why they don't talk about it much. And I think times are changing because we've had so much, well, let me say this, times are changing across the world but in Nigeria, you've had these types of things happen all along. And sometimes they turn a blind eye to it because they just say it's just a part of doing business here in Nigeria. Right. Yeah. That's not the right answer. But that's what folks at the decision making level say. But guess what happens consistently? The international operators that come to work there and unfortunately, the local national operators get impacted in such a way that they never truly get to optimize and monetize their assets. Does that make sense? That's right. So we got another question uh, on uh, drone surveillance and refineries. I'm going to save it after we talk about refineries in Nigeria. So okay. before we just to start uh, uh, the open it to, to the participant, we were discussing yeah. about all these oil thefts in Niger Delta and all yeah. those uh, informal refineries. Something fascinating for the students was to uh, learn the process of refinery in those like normal refinery towers that 
how the refining process works, and then coming into uh, countries like especially Nigeria, looking to those oil tests and yeah. those huge ovens, which would, they were calling it oven, those informal refineries, some calls it teapot refinery or, or ovens that they were just boiling huge amount of crude oil and extract uh, refined petroleum products from right. that. So well, I'll, I'll share, I'll do, a, I'll do a share screen to show you what, yeah, what, I, what I've seen. And then yes, some of these Because pictures. you said that you've been there and you were yeah, actually yeah. So, so, working so, so, those operations. Yeah, so, so I, I've been there um, several times. Uh, as you know, I used to be the Marine and Naval Attaché to Nigeria. And part of my portfolio as the U.S. Marine and Naval Attaché to Nigeria was about how do we help uh, in, uh, 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 encourage uh, good security for the operators that come and operate in that in that market, the international operators. And I was very fortunate; I got to stand up what's called the, the Niger Delta Working Group, which is a, which was an information sharing between all the operators, the local, national, and the international players who operated in, in that market. And then I went back as a, as a professional and, and consulted in the oil and gas business. And so on both times, you know, I've been uh, in and out of the creeks and now our company has a major office in Abuja, but a, but a sales office down in Lagos. And we go in and out of Lagos and Port Harcourt, my teams do. And I'll show you now, I'll do a quick share screen just of some of these Yes. And makeshift refinery operation. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Can you guys uh can you guys see this right now? Uh, let me see. It's coming. Yes. Yes, right. So okay. so th that is a uh a makeshift uh collection point, right? And let me go go here to show you some of the um you see what they pulled out of the ground. What you see here is uh one of our clients uh had a uh, almost 10 to 20,000 barrels a day being stolen from their production capacity. And they had to go search miles and miles into the creeks to find out, hey, what is really going on here? Uh, and they found these collection points in these evacu evacuation facilities. Like right here, you can see a makeshift flow station uh, right there with these pipes. And they'll, these little very small diameter pipes that you see will be running for miles and miles and miles so what is their capacity usually like? How much is the capacity of like? Uh, it, it, it would vary from 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 place to place and station to station. And one of the things I wish you could see, um, it's kind of back over here. You really can't see it too much. This is kind of a makeshift collection point, and then they literally have a refining, a small refining capacity right right behind the collection point, right? And yeah. one of the things that you'll find, one of the telltale signs, is some of the that people get lazy and they leave some of their material out in the in the forest, and that will let you know that hey, there's something going on close by, right? And so this was was an indicator that there was some real offtake happening that shouldn't have illegal offtake from the the evacuation operation that the operator had, right? And then that uh, that product is then uh, collected into these makeshift collection points, and then various very close to these makeshift collection points, there's then refining uh going on kind of makeshift refining in addition to that sometimes the crude is just taken and then to another kind of very hidden uh, evacuation point where it's loaded into uh, uh, a non-flagged barge or or crude crude vessel and then that's sold on the black market and so here you can see how they do these operations um this was a discovery of of this asset deep in the deep in the creeks they had to you know barge this thing in this big tractor in mm -hmm. then it had to go for miles into the into the mangroves right just to even find the facility and start to dig up the things around it so unfortunately in nigeria they deal with this all the time right mm -hmm. and so the issue is well how do you prevent that part of it is you heard me talk about this thing called domain awareness superiority where mm -hmm. you not only have the physical and the cyber and the technical solutions in place, you also have this kind of mastery and understanding of the human terrain around your operation. Yes. Who are the people in uh, the environment where you're building this facility? One of the things that we saw happen in Algeria during that attack is uh, the CNOC guys who are operating there, I'm sorry, the OMV guys who are operating there is that they, they really didn't notice that some of the guards had changed shift that, that they'd never seen before. Oh. Right? 
there were some people in the community who had shut down their shops that day in 2013 because they knew some impending attack was going to happen. But none of the employees or none of the leadership of the operators who supported that operation were aware of that. Right. And so that's why you have to understand what's happening um, in your in your environment and achieve what we call this domain awareness superiority. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, we were watching together with a student a uh, documentary on this that how they wait for the, the weather to get dark and then they will start running these huge fires right. to separate the oil. And then they right. would, as you say, you talked about these ransom operations that how some of these uh, militia tries to get money from the government because they think that they never benefit from the oil money or That's oil right. economy. So they're trying to. Uh, then when the government uh, kind of stops this operation, these ransom militias would uh, take revenge on the facilities and infrastructure, right. blowing up the pipelines just to uh, kind of retaliate and prevent the government to stop their operations. Because it's not so hard to find those, you know, I mean, if you just have a helicopter or like a, a satellite image, it's not hard to find those illegal refineries. Well, hold on. I, I, I have to tell you this. I mean, what you saw was kind of an open area that was cleared. But when yeah. you go into the mangroves in a place like Nigeria, it's almost it's beyond triple canopy um, forestation. Right. It yeah. is no kidding. A serious amount of forest forestation. You can't. The satellites can't penetrate that. Oh, and they're they hard can. to see, right? And and the um, Niger Delta militants and the criminals who who uh, illegally evacuate this crew from these operating operating stations. They know that, and they've become very refined at their ability to 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 do these types of things, do these types of operations. So I will just uh, go back. We have plenty of questions from the participants. And uh, the one on the refinery was, um, can you tell us about the drone surveillance? Uh, is it and can it be cost effective for a small refinery? And are new privacy regulations making it tougher to customize the surveillance system? Absolutely. Yes to all, <laughs> right? To all you just said. I'll walk, walk backwards on that. So... There are some regulatory issues, even here in the States, about the ability to use drones to do protective surveillance, right? Because the issue is, what else are you looking at with that drone, right? And so those those become big issues. There are some countries, like in Nigeria, there are only one or two companies that have licenses to even operate a drone. Now, some could argue in some of those countries that don't have legislation to support drone operations, People will operate drones anyway. Yeah. They, they will do that. Uh, it, it is co a cost of effective way to do it, but you can also get yourself a left of the line of, of local and, and federal governments uh, in these nations if, if you do operate those drones without authorization. So that's a really weird issue there because drones have to be operated in a, co in a coordinated type of way. Uh, and if they're not operated in a coordinated type of way, sometimes you don't even know if the drone's entering your space. Is, you, you have to ask the question, right? Is that my drone? <laughs> right. And That's now right. you've got drones out there that have the capability to enact um, almost uh, it's very crude cyber attack type of things. Right. You'll have a drone hover over a facility. Then through Wi-Fi, it's able to get into that network and then cause an attack there. So very, very dicey dicey type of um, uh, situation that you have with drones. It's, it, we know how to use them. We know how to help you set up uh, what we call that domain awareness superiority using drones, like in this kind of three dimensional type of way, right? Mm -hmm. One dimensional if you include cyberspace, right? But uh, in terms of the, what a drone could do to attack a facility, we've seen that happen. We saw that in its biggest impact currently in Saudi Arabia. and Really, the issue is drones are becoming better just for recreational purposes. But you've got te technology prof profusion happening where that drone is then being taken and then turned into something else, whether it be a delivery vehicle, whether it be some type of uh, deliver, you know, delivery vehicle for some kind of small bomb like a 40 millimeter grenade or that the literally now they're being used to hover over targets and try and access Wi-Fi networks. Right. And so, you know, they, they pose a real threat. 
And if you don't have some counter drone capability as a part of your overall uh, risk mitigation effort, then, then you've got a, a serious gap uh, against that, you know, uh, against that facility. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, this is this question was from the from our doctoral students that is doing uh, spend a lot of time on this topic. I know, and um, uh, I wish that this could be a face to face event, and I know the discussion could go, but. Uh, back and forth. We have another um, questions from one of the participants. Um, uh, I don't think this is part of our students, but he's uh, he asked your opinion about the sanction U.S. sanctions on Russia's Nord Stream gas pipeline project to Germany, and if you think this will have much effect. Uh, interesting from a geopolitical perspective, right? Super interesting. More, more your lane, Sarah. You know, you, you, you're the geopolitical leg of energy security. But I will tell you this: um, well, so I'm trying not to go too classified because there are things that you hear that, that you <laughs> yeah. shouldn't. Tell us what you can about. tell us. Right. Topic, yeah. Exactly. Right. And we have audiences from around the world. You know, we had questions yeah, yeah. from Europe. And, yep. 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 Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll say this, you know, as an American, I understand what our policy is, but I think it creates a very dicey environment. And there are actors that are state level and non-state level that could impact this in a lot of ways. And so I would say that uh, it has caused discussion that has, um, you know, I've been a part of some some really interesting discussions on this very topic, right? So um, I would tell you that we are seeing from an indications and warning perspective on the cyber side of the house, threats that could happen to impact this engagement either way it goes, right? Against those who are impacting and impeding Nord Stream taking off and against those who are making Nord Stream go in spite of what the sanctions say. Right. And yeah. so I both both sides need to be very careful with this um, because there is a lot of economic impact that this thing has. And there are a lot of people who win both if Nord Stream loses or if Nord Stream wins. Right. And so there are interests in that that are not just state level, but they're non state actors as well who pose potential threats on both sides. I see that you're looking at it as a retaliation threat side, uh, which is interesting. As you said, all energy security is a very complex issue. So it yes. has its own market analysis and geopolitics right, right. into actual operational yep. uh, and uh, threat, uh, threats against infrastructure, which uh, we, we were so fortunate to have you today. Um, Thank you. An Thank actual you. person that was involved. Uh, underground and it was fascinating looking at those pictures in Nigeria and uh, looking into that and then combining with what we were discussing uh, about the cyber security um, mm -hmm. about what you um, discussed in uh, Saudi attack which uh, was very interesting actually the market was watching very closely yep. the whole uh, the whole world and no one was expecting it the interesting thing mm -hmm. about the threats against infrastructure is that it comes from where people don't expect it. That's right. And Saudi Arabia had all these anti-missile defense um, uh, equipment, and no one could expect that like some drones could create such um, havoc. Ha exactly. Yeah. Um, so th these are all very fascinating uh, topics and very important uh, to consider when we are looking onto into our risks, uh, both external risks. Mm -hmm. uh, and also domestic risks when it comes to um, uh, our uh, normal conversation when it comes to energy security and uninterrupted flow of energy and um, right. prices, you know, the affordable prices, diversification of resources, mm -hmm. and diversification of suppliers. So it's all uh, very interesting. I just see that there is another question. Um, I have, um, I'd yeah. like to share just one thing. And, sure, sure. And, um, you know, you said something very critical, and I think people need to really understand this kind of theme, right? Mm -hmm. this, this risk mitigation theme. It, it has direct impact 
on your ability to maintain continuity of operations and achieve this kind of nebulous state of resiliency, right? It's not just about the geopolitics. It's not just about financial risks and what the guys at Sockchain and BNP Paribas are talking about. It is really about on the ground from a physical cyber and technical security perspective. Are you doing the things to ensure that if worst case scenario happens, you can get back online as quickly as possible to, uh, you know, optimize and monetize that asset, right? And, and so one of the things that we do, my, you know, I think I've talked to you about this. We do what's called an energy security risk and resiliency assessment. Yeah. This is back to your question about what do you tell people that we need to do? What, what you know, what should they do? And, and we always argue that get an assessment done so you understand where you stand, right? Yes. And, and I'm going to do a quick share screen one more time, if you no. don't mind. No, no. And uh, I don't know if you can, can see this. Um, can you, Let me know if you can see this. Yes. But this is the, really the process we tell people to go through, right? Yes. Which is, hey, assess and understand your current exposure, right? And focus on all those things that are, you know, generation, transmission, distribution, uh, upstream, midstream, downstream, et cetera. Analyze the threats because they come from multiple vectors. Right. Mm -hmm. You have to make sure that you're even looking at the things you just talked about. You say sometimes the threats come from places you don't expect. Yes. Right. They, 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 they come like no one in Saudi expected that some very cheap drones, what they call group two drones, would be used to vector some group three drones to cause billions of dollars of damage instantaneously. No one thought about that. Right. And mm -hmm. then when you through an assessment, somebody will able will be able to advise you on what are the real countermeasures you need to put in place. And then you can match those against your key performance indicators, right? And your organizationally defined values and say, hey, here's what I need in order to meet my, my uh, requirements. Uh, and you have some, you, then in the, you develop that for, for, for yourself in kind of a bespoke uh, kind of manner. And then you, you make it consistent. You're constantly going back and reassessing. You don't leave it. It's not, you know, your security is not static, right? You don't say, hey, we've got all the pieces in place. And we're good to go. That's it. Right. At the CEO level, the CEO, the board has, has to constantly say to themselves, where are we from a risk mitigation perspective? Uh, or, or, or are we in a posture that's going to let us not just mitigate the risk, but also give us confidence that we're going to be able to maintain our continuity of operations, right? If you're not having that conversation and you don't understand really uh, how to optimize and monetize that asset, and it's clear you don't understand your operating environment. Well, we have a question from uh, one of our uh, interns. He's asking, in countries where the rule of law is weaker, many oil-rich nations, to what extent the private companies invest in anti-corruption measures to protect their assets? That's interesting, right? I, yeah. We could talk for an hour about that alone, right? It would depend on the type of company. It would depend on where that company was coming from. If, is it a Western company? Is it an Asian company? Is it a Middle Eastern or African company? Um, and the issue sometimes is, isn't corruption, right? Yes. Sometimes it is. I mean, you know, one of the things that we just we discovered very recently for a client in a particular country I will go that will go unnamed um, in East Africa, mm -hmm. it had invited in some international uh, oil company players, right, um, from the Asian region to come in and operate, uh, and it found that some of its own data that parastatal in that country, some of its own data that was particular to, to it and what you would call sovereign data was mm -hmm. being hacked and stolen by an, a major Asian regional player, right? So, you know, from a corruption standpoint, it's very hard to talk about corruption um, and how it's, it either impacts or doesn't impact the physical security of an asset. But it does impact that asset's ability to maintain its continuity of operations because there are drivers in there sometimes, particularly around cash, where people will withhold payments for people to maintain their continuity of ops, right, yeah. so that they can get a better deal on the back end. And, and we see that all the time. You know, I don't deal with that. That's more of a criminal issue, right? 
uh, than, an, than an operational security issue, but it does happen. That's, that was very interesting. Again, um, I, I like to go back, uh, just one, add one more point on Nigeria that you mentioned, which is very important, is that Nigeria and is one of the members of the OPEC. And one of the issues that OPEC has always with Nigeria is their oil production quota. And that's actually raised again in the current uh, or past uh, meeting of the OPEC that Nigeria was not complying with the um, OPEC uh, uh, production cut quota. And now Nigeria has committed uh, into a new production cut uh, schedule that is going to add few more months until September, cutting back production to make for what did not cut back in past few months. But then is the issue of government and the investors and companies that these companies, private companies, they need to sell what they, you know, what produce what they make their profits and investment returns. Why there is the issue of oil theft. And we were talking before, uh, again, uh, together before uh, the event start, and you were saying that the, the client and the, the, the case that you were showing us, it was a 20,000 barrels per day of uh, yeah. oil uh, production. So, right? Yes, I mean, yeah. adding all these. But, but imagine, right? So these are small producers. Yeah. Right? They're producing less than 100,000 barrels a day. So you, you imagine the impact at 20,000 barrels a day. But what if it was just five? The impact for them is still great. Right, because it's because you look at who who they're employing, what their requirements are based on the JB they have with like NNPC or you know or what whatever part of whether it's NNPC or one of the arms of NNPC. You know, you get yourself in a lot of trouble there. So it is a very tough environment for them, uh, the local operators in particular, and uh, it always has, as you talked about, this kind of secondary tertiary impact, right? Because yeah. now it impacts. You know, Nigeria has opened up the market to these local operators and let them go in and produce. But part of their production goes to Nigeria's overall production. And then Nigeria has to say, I can't meet my production quotas. Why? Because I got theft and vandalism and attacks happening. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to manage those and deal with those because they come also from areas that they don't expect at times as well. Very dynamic environment down there. Well, thank you, Derek. It was yeah. really such a pleasure to having you today. Um, it was wonderful having you because um, hearing about the geopolitical side is what uh, the students we discuss about it, but having an actual operational guy uh, with such an extensive diplomatic and operational uh, experience uh, on the ground was really a pleasure. Uh, we have one last a comment from one of the audience, Mr. Robert Alberts. Uh, please tell Mr. Derek Campbell, thank you and simplify. <laughs> okay, hoorah, simplify, always. <laughs> hoorah. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. I'll, I'll, uh, Lindsay, uh, it's all yours now. <laughs> well, I would like to, like to thank Mr. Campbell and Dr. Bakshuri for joining us today and all of you who tuned in here on Zoom and on Facebook. Um, if anyone attending is interested in attending other upcoming webinar events, supporting IWP or applying to one of our graduate programs, please go to iwp.edu. Thanks again for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank Good you, Derek. Thanks, Lindsay. Yeah, cheers. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody.